Section three of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter by Montague Glass. Chapter three Dead Men's Shoes. Part one. There goes that sucker, Aaron Kronberg, from Port Sullivan, Abe Potash declared to his partner, Morris Perlmutter, as they looked from the windows of their showroom to the opposite sidewalk some four stories below. Ain't it funny that fellow would never buy from us a dollar's worth more goods? The reason ain't hard to find, Abe, Morris replied. Once a garment buyer gets into the hands of a competitor like Leon Samet, it's all off. I bet you Leon tells him we're all kinds of crooks and swindlers. What could you expect from a cutthroat like Leon Samet? That fellow's no good, and his father before him is also a thief. I know his people from the old country yet. One was worser as the other. Well, there's nothing the matter with Aaron's cousin Alex Kronberg, anyhow, Morris observed. That fellow does a fine business in Bridgetown, and Samet brothers can no more take his trade away from us than they could fly. That ain't our fault, Morris, Abe rejoined. Samet Brothers is fly enough to do anything, Morris, but the way Aaron Kronberg hates Alex Kronberg, if they was to sell Alex a single garment, you understand, Aaron would never buy from them a dollar's worth more goods so long as he lived. He ain't a disgrace them two fellas as such enemies, Abe. Alex ain't no enemy, Morris, Abe said. It's Aaron what's the enemy. Alex don't trouble himself at all. He told me so himself. But that's the way it goes, Morris. Moshe Kronberg, Hillel Kronberg, and Elkin Kronberg was three brothers, which you don't see nowadays at all. More like friends than brothers, Morris. Hillel died ten years ago, and I thought it would broke Moshe's heart. He looked after Hillel's widow and Hillel's boy, Alex, because Moshe never married, Morris. He was a born uncle. Then when Elkin died a year later, you never saw a fellow so broke up like Moshe in all my life. He goes to work and sends Elkin's boy Aaron to business college. And Elkin's widow he takes to live with Hillel's widow, all together with himself and the two boys in that house of his on Madison Street. For three years they lived that way, and in the rest of the house Moshe couldn't keep any tenants at all. At last he gives Aaron a couple of thousand dollars, and Alex the same. And Aaron buys up a store in Port Sullivan, and Alex goes up to Bridgetown. "'What became of the widows, Abe?' Morris asked. "'I don't know is Elkin's widow living now out or not,' Abe said. "'But Moshe told me Hillel's widow wants to get married again. "'And Alex comes up to him and says he should give the old lady anyhow a thousand dollars. "'Moshe wants to know what for, and Alex tells him he owes it from Hillel's estate yet a couple of thousand dollars. "'And did he?' Morris inquired. "'Suppose he did,' Abe replied. He is entitled to it after what he puts up with during them three years they live together. Well, Moshe and Alex gets right away fighting about it. And I guess Alex would have sued Moshe in the courts yet, only the old lady goes to work and dies on him all of a sudden. But why is Aaron and Alex such enemies, Abe? Morris asked. Well, it's like this, Morris. Aaron and Alex is good friends. Until Uncle Moshe cuts Alex out of his will. You see, Aaron and Alex is the only two relations which Moshe got at all, so naturally when Aaron thinks he is coming in for the whole thing, he begins to get sore at Alex. And the more Aaron thinks that the old man really ought to leave half to Alex, the more he gets sore at Alex. The whole business is dead wrong, Abe, Morris commented. In the first place, the old man ain't got no right to leave his money only to Aaron. And in the second place... Aaron ain't got no right to feel sore at Alex. And furthermore, Alex ought to go around and see his uncle once in a while when he's in New York, in the third place. Well, why don't you tell him so this afternoon, Morris? Abe said. Alex is staying up at the Prince Clarence since last night already, and he said he would be sure down here this afternoon. I will do so, Morris replied firmly. Go ahead, Abe said. Only one thing I got to tell you, Mars. There is some customers which would stand anything, Mars. You could ship them two garments short in every order. You can send them goods which ain't no more like the sample than bread is like matzes. You could overcharge them in your statements. 
you could even draw on em one day after their account is due and still they would buy goods from you but as soon as you start to butt into their family affairs morris that's the finish morris they'd leave you like a shot alex kronberg wouldn't take it so particular morris retorted he knows i'm only doing it for his own good oh if you're only going to do it for his own good morris then that's something again abe said because in that case we would not only lose him for a customer morris but we would also make an enemy of him for life you shouldn't worry morris replied as he put on his hat preparatory to going out to lunch i know how to take care of a customer all right nevertheless morris cogitated his partner's advice throughout the entire lunch hour and over his dessert he commenced to formulate a tentative plan for restoring alex kronberg to his inheritance two cups of coffee and a second helping of mon cake aided the process of celebrating this scheme so that when morris returned to his place of business it was nearly two o'clock abe he said as he entered i've been thinking over this here matter about alex kronberg and i ain't gonna talk to alex about it at all you know what i'm gonna do abe grabbed his hat and turned to morris with a savage glare sure i know what you're gonna do morris potash bellowed belligerently henceforth from tomorrow on you're going to do this morris you're going to lunch after i am coming back i could drop dead from hunger already for all you care i got a stomach too morris and don't you forget it moshe kronberg lived on the ground floor of his own tenement house on madison street and to say that aaron kronberg worshipped the ground his uncle walked on would be to utter the literal truth well uncle how do you feel today aaron inquired the morning after abe and morris had so thoroughly discussed the kronberg family relations i could feel a whole lot better aaron and i could feel a whole lot worse moshe kronberg replied them suckers has been after me again which ones are they now aaron asked his curiosity aroused an orphan asylum moshe replied the gall which some people got it aaron honestly you wouldn't believe it at all they want me i should give em two hundred and fifty dollars i told em time enough when i would die got so hooten. what are you talking nonsense uncle moshe aaron broke in you ain't going to die for a long time yet and anyhow uncle moshe if people goes to work and has children in which they couldn't support while they're living even why should they get any of your, your money to support em even after you're dead no one asks them suckers they should have children ain't i right sure you are right uncle moshe agreed hospitals also aaron if i got one hospital bothering me i must got a dozen why should i bother myself with hospitals aaron a low-life gambler hangs around liquor saloons all times of the night till he gets sick you understand then he must go to a hospital and get well on my money yet i see myself what hospital was that aaron inquired the mount hebron hospital uncle Bosher replied there's the catalogue now they're sending it to me this morning only aaron sees the annual report and list of donating members of the hospital and opened it at the letter k you know what i think uncle aaron cried i think that alex kronberg puts him up to asking you for money alex puts him up to it moshe repeated what for should alex do such a thing here let me show you aaron cried alex himself gives them fake as five dollars here it is in black and white alex kronberg bridgetown pennsylvania five dollars uncle moshe adjusted a pair of eyeglasses to his broad flat nose and perused the record of his nephew's extravagance with bulging eyes well what do you think for a sucker like that he exclaimed i tell you the honest truth uncle aaron said i don't want to say nothing about alex at all but the way the fellow is acting just because he does a little good business in his store honestly it's a disgrace he sends my mother for ten dollars a birthday present too do i need that sucker he should give my mother birthday presents he's throwing away his money left and right and the first thing you know he's coming to you borrowing yet he should save himself the trouble uncle moshe declared 
His tongue should be hanging out of his mouth with hunger, Aaron, and I wouldn't give him oh so one cent. Aaron's face broke into a thousand wrinkles as he beamed with satisfaction. Well, uncle, he said, I must be going. I got a whole lot of things to do today. Take care of yourself. Don't worry about me, Aaron's uncle Moshe replied. I can take care of myself, all right. You wouldn't drink maybe a glass of schnapps or something before you go? No? All right. He always delayed his proffer of hospitality until Aaron was on the front stoop. After the latter had turned the corner of Pike Street, Uncle Moshe lingered to take the morning air. A fresh breeze from the southwest brought with it a faint odor of salt herring and onions from the grocery store next door, while from the bakery across the street came the fragrant evidence of a large batch of kummelbrot. He sighed contently and turned to re-enter the house, but even as he did so, he wheeled about in response to the greeting, "'How do you do, Mr. Kronberg?' The speaker was none other than Morris Perlmutter, who had tossed on his pillow until past midnight, devising a plan for approaching Uncle Moshe in a plausible manner. Now that his quarry had fallen so opportunely within his grasp, Morris's face wreathed itself in smiles of such amiability that Uncle Moshe grew at once suspicious. "'You got the advantage from me,' he said. "'Why, don't you know me?' Morris cooed. "'I think,' Uncle Moshe replied guardedly, "'I seen you once it before somewheres. "'You're a collector for a hospital or an orphan asylum "'or some such sucker game, ain't it?' "'Morris laughed mirthlessly. "'His discarded plan for renewing his acquaintance with Uncle Moshe "'had involved the pretense that he was seeking to interest "'the old gentleman in the home for chronic invalids.' independent order Matai Aaron, of which fraternity Morris was an active member, and Uncle Moshe's apparent distaste for organized charity proved rather disconcerting. "'You're a poor gasser, Mr. Kronberg,' he said. "'Then you are connected with some charity, ain't it?' Uncle Moshe continued. Morris denied it indignantly. "'Gotzel Houghton,' he said. "'My name is Mr. Perlmutter, and I'm in the cloak and suit business.' "'Oh, I remember now,' Uncle Moshe cried. The news that Morris was no charity worker restored him to high good humor. "'I remember you perfect now,' he said, shaking hands effusively with Morris. "'You got a partner by the name Potash, ain't it?' "'That's right,' Morris replied. "'And what brings you over here in this Nachbarschaft?' Uncle Moshe inquired." Morris looked from Uncle Moshe to the tarnished brass plate on the side of the tenement house door. It read as follows, M. Kronberg, Real Estate. The fact is, Morris said, I'm coming to see you in a business way. If you've got time, I'd like to say a little something to you. Come inside, Uncle Moshe grunted. He thought he discerned a furtive timidity in his visitor's manner, strongly indicative of an impending touch. "'In the first place,' he began, after Morris was seated, "'I ain't got so much money which people think I got it.' "'I never thought you did,' said Morris, and Uncle Moshe glared in response. "'But I ain't no beggar neither, you understand,' he retorted. "'I got a little something left, anyhow.' "'Sure, I know,' Morris agreed. "'But what have you got, or what you ain't got is neither here nor there. "'I'm coming over this morning to ask you something, a question.' Here he paused. He had not yet determined what that question would be, and it occurred to him that unless it were sufficiently momentous to account for his presence on the Lower East Side during the busiest hours of a business day, Uncle Moshe would show him the door. Go ahead and ask it then. Uncle Moshe broke in impatiently. I couldn't sit here all day. The fact is, Morris said slowly, and then his mind reverted to the brass plate on the door, and at once he proceeded with renewed confidence. The fact is, I'm coming over here to ask you something, a question which a friend of mine would like to buy a property on the east side. A property? Uncle Moshe repeated. A 
property is something else again what for a property would your friend like to buy it a fine property morris replied a property like you got it here but this here property ain't for sale uncle moshe said i got the house here now since eighteen ninety already and i guess i would keep it sure i know that's all right morris went on but i thought even if you wouldn't want to sell the house you know such a whole lot about real estate mr kronberg it could help us out a little the hard lines about uncle moshe's mouth relaxed into a smile well when it comes to real estate he said i ain't a fool exactly you understand that's what i was told morris continued a friend of mine he says to me if anyone could tell you about real estate moshe kronberg could there's a man, he says, which his opinion you could trust in it anything what he says is so. If the Astors and the Golets would know about East Side real estate what the fellow knows, understand me, instead of their hundreds of millions, they would have thousands of millions already. Uncle Moshe fairly beamed. Yes, Mr. Kronberg, Morris went on, without taking a breath. He says to me you should go and see Uncle Moshe. He's a gentleman, and he would treat you all right. But I says to him I get no right to butt in your Uncle Moshe. You see, Alex, I says. Alex? Uncle Moshe cried. Did Alex Kronberg send you here? That's who it was, Morris replied. Then all I can say is, Uncle Moshe thundered, you should go right back to Alex and tell him from me that I says any friend of his which he comes to me looking for information about real estate, he's lucky I don't kick him into the street yet. He jumped up from his chair and opened the door leading into the public hall. Go on, he roared, out from my house. Morris rose leisurely to his feet and pulled a large cigar from his pocket. If that's the way you feel about it, Mr. Kronberg, Sean Good. I wouldn't bother you any more. At the same time, Mr. Kronberg, if ever you should want to sell the house, you understand? Let me know. That's all. As he passed out of the door, he laid the cigar on a side table, and its bright red band immediately caught the eye of Uncle Moshe. He pounced on it, and was about to hurl it after his departing visitor, when something about the smoothness of the wrapper made him pause. Five minutes later, he lolled back in a horsehair-covered rocker and puffed contentedly at Morris's cigar. After all, he said, I might get a good price for the house anyway. From Moshe Kronberg's tenement house on Madison Street to the Cloak and Suit District at 19th Street and 5th Avenue is less than two miles as the crow flies, but Morris Perlmutter's journey uptown was accomplished in less direct fashion. He spent over half an hour in an antiquated horse car, and by the time the Broadway car to which he transferred had reached Madison Square, it was nearly twelve o'clock. As he walked down 19th Street, he almost collided with Abe, whose face wore a frown. "'Say, looky here, Morris,' he cried. "'What kind of business is this?' Here you are, just getting downtown, and I'm going out to lunch already. Sure, I know, Morris retorted. You think of nothing but your stomach. Believe me, Abe, I worked hard enough this morning. Worked nothing, Abe rejoined. You've been up to some monkey business, Morris. Otherwise, why should Moshe Kronberg telephone us just now? He thought the matter over since you left there, and he would be up to see you this afternoon already. What? Morris cried. Did Moshe Kronberg telephone that himself? All right, Morris, then I'm a liar, Abe exploded. I'm telling you with my own ears. I heard him. I believe you, Abe, Morris said soothingly. Don't hurry back from your lunch. I got lots of time. I would hurry back, Oda, not as I please, Morris, Abe retorted as he trudged off toward Hammersmith's restaurant. There, he ministered to his outraged feelings with a steaming dish of gefilte rinderburst, and it was not until he had sopped up the last drop of gravy with a piece of rye bread that he became conscious of a stranger sitting opposite to him. "'Excuse me,' said the latter. "'You got a little soup on the lapel of your coat.' "'That ain't soup,' Abe explained, as he dipped his napkin in the glass of ice water and started to remove the stain." That's a little gefilte rinderbrust, which they fix it so thin and watery nowadays, it might just as well be soup the way it's always getting all over your clothes. 
things ain't the same like they used to be the stranger remarked twenty twenty-five years ago a feller could get a meal down on canal street for a quarter understand me which it was really something you could say was remarkable take any of them places gifkins or to wasserbauer's ain't i right did you used to went to gifkins abe asked i should say his v a v replied when i was a boy of fifteen i am eating always regular by gifkins me too i used to eat a whole lot by gifkins abe said in fact i think must have seen you there i shouldn't wonder the stranger continued at the time i was working by my old man baum right across from gifkins he was my uncle already you are old man baum's nephew abe exclaimed how could that be old man baum only got one brother nathan which he got mixed up in a railroad accident near knoxville he was always up to some monkey business that fellow olaf Sholom. sure i know the stranger continued but old man baum got also one sister my mother mrs gershon you must remember my father sam gershon worked for years by richter as a cutter my name is max gershon why sure i do abe said shaking hands with his new-found acquaintance so you're son of old man gershon do you live here in new york mr gershon no i live in johnsville texas mr gershon replied this is my first visit north in twenty-five years mr mr potash abe said mr potash gershon continued i'm feeling pretty lonesome i can tell you all my folks is dead my father my mother my two uncles and there ain't a soul here in new york which remembers me at all is that so abe commented with ready sympathy yes mr potash gershon said when i was a boy i done a full thing when i was sixteen years old already i run away from home because my father licked me and i never wrote to him or sent him no word to him until it was too late you see up to five years since i didn't done so good everything seemed to went against me mr potash but lately i'm doing a fine business for a small place like johnsonville and today i got the best store down there you don't say so abe cried so i thought last month instead i would go to dallas or fort worth like i usually done i would come straight on to new york and not only buy my fall goods but also give the good old folks a surprise and what do i find everybody's dead mr gershon pressed a handkerchief to his eyes you shouldn't take on so abe said leaning across the table and placing his hand on gershon's arm it's the way of the world mr gershon and i could assure you we got the finest line of garments in our store which is first-class stuff up to the minute and prices and everything just right mr gershon wiped his eyes you must excuse me mr potash he said my feelings has got the better of me that's all right abe murmured here is our card and you should positively come up to see us even if you wouldn't buy from us a button mr gershon it would be a pleasure for us to see you in our place i would sure be there mr gershon said as he pocketed the card waiter abe called put this here gentleman's check on mine and bring us two of them thirty-cent cigars so eagerly did morris await the advent of uncle moshe kronberg in potash and perlmutter's store that he even omitted to notice his partner's prolonged absence at lunch and when abe returned to unfold the narrative of his meeting with a prospective customer morris heard it without interest the feller is a number one morris abe said i stopped off to see sam fetter at the kosciuszko bank and sam sent me to the associated information bureau he is rated twenty to thirty thousand credit good yes morris replied tell me abe did moshe kronberg say just when he would be here what are you wasting your time about moshe kronberg for abe retorted we got enough to do we should pick out a few good styles to show gershon morris nodded absently his thoughts were centered on a short old man with close-cropped beard who at that very moment was turning the corner of fifth avenue and nineteenth street simultaneously aaron kronberg ran across the street from samet brothers doorway and clapped the old gentleman on the shoulder hello uncle moshe he cried what are you doing around here couldn't i come uptown once in a while if i would want to uncle moshe replied somewhat testily sure sure aaron kronberg hastened to say gee it 
i never eat in the middle of the day uncle moshe said i am up here on business on business amram repeated what for business i think i sold the house moshe replied for one brief moment aaron gazed at his uncle and then he linked his arm in that of the old man come over to twenty-third street and drink anyhow a cup of coffee he said and ten minutes later they entered an enameled brick dairy restaurant you say you think you sold the house aaron said after a waitress had served them uncle moshe nodded he was emptying a cup of coffee in long noisy inhalations and at the same time consuming cheese sandwiches with uncommonly keen appetite for a man who had never ate in the middle of the day yes aaron uncle moshe said as he emerged all dripping from the cup i think i sold the house and i guess i would have another cup of coffee go ahead aaron replied but what for you want to sell the house uncle moshe it brings you in anyhow a good income a good income for some people aaron but for me not what is one thousand a year aaron one thousand a year uncle is a whole lot especially to a man like you what lives simple my living expenses is very little i admit aaron uncle moshe replied after he had disposed of the second cup of coffee with noises approximating a bathtub full of soapy water disappearing down the waste pipe i don't make no fuss about my living aaron but you gotta remember aaron that a man couldn't live on living expenses alone once in a while a fellow likes to take a little flyer in the market and try and make a few dollars ain't it what aaron exclaimed that was a phase of his uncle's character that he had never exposed before yes aaron uncle moshe continued living ain't only having a room to sleep in and food to eat aaron other things is living aaron stocks is living and auction pinnacle is also living and going once in a while on theatre is living too aaron i may be an old man aaron but i ain't dead yet aaron's pale face grew almost ghastly at these shocking disclosures and when uncle moshe concluded his audacious creed with a furtive wink his nephew visibly started but you got plenty of other money to invest in the stock market without you would sell the house uncle moshe he said have i uncle moshe rejoined that's news to me aaron you see in nineteen seven was a big panic and some stocks is better as others them which ain't aaron they went and gone so low aaron they ain't never come back again and perhaps never will might you heard something about it in port sullivan maybe ten thousand dollars i dropped on them suckers in wall street aaron uncle moshe smiled blandly at his nephew who grasped the edge of the table to steady his whirling senses but what's the use talking uncle moshe continued what is for by is for by and i guess i would have another cup of coffee you had enough coffee aaron cried sternly so you gone and dropped your money on stocks eh uncle moshe shrugged and extended one palm in philosophic resignation it was my own money aaron he said i didn't stole it this ain't no time for making jokes uncle moshe aaron retorted who was it you was going to sell the house to maybe you know him uncle moshe said it's a fellow by the name of morris perlmutter aaron kronberg's pallor gave way to a flood of crimson and for a moment he choked incoherently as he gazed at uncle moshe in amazement why that fellow perlmutter is a friend of alex he gasped at length sure i know uncle moshe replied but even if he is a friend of alex his money ain't counterfeit but he'd rob you of your shirt uncle moshe aaron exclaimed he's a dangerous fella i'm used to dangerous fellas aaron uncle moshe answered calmly i told you before i dropped ten thousand in wall street yes and if you had sold us here house uncle moshe you'd drop ten thousand more not ten thousand aaron i only got eight thousand equity in the house again aaron stared at his uncle do you mean to tell me you only got eight thousand dollars in the world he groaned the world is a pretty big place aaron uncle moshe said but i wouldn't lie to you anyhow eight thousand is the figure 
then all i can say is uncle moshe before you were got to go begging on the streets yet you would better sell the house and come to live with me up in port sullivan uncle moshe shrugged once more i'll tell you the truth aaron he said i was going to suggest that to you myself yet so let's get right off and see this here pearl mutter and we'll talk about port sullivan later not by a damn sight aaron declared as he rose from his chair and grasped his uncle firmly by the arm you come with me and we'll sell this house to a feller i know End of section three.